Well, there are several things we can see from this that suggest certainty. In the first place, a person who accepts the testimony of God, in verse 11, this is the testimony of God that God has given us eternal life. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Now, the person who accepts that testimony, according to verse 13, knows, knows that he has eternal life. He doesn't say, I think I have eternal life. Probably I have eternal life. I have some confidence that maybe I have eternal life. That person doesn't say it would be presumptuous to say I have eternal life. <coughs> that person says, I have to say that I have eternal life because Jesus guarantees it. And to do otherwise is to call Jesus a liar. Because he says the one who believes in him has everlasting life. I believe in him, therefore what do I have? I have everlasting life. And I know I have it, and that's why John writes that. Secondly, John's readers were confused believers. And this doesn't come out so easily in the English, because notice he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Has it ever puzzled you how John can say that? He's just said the person who believes the testimony of God knows he has eternal life. And then he says, these things I'm writing to you who believe that you may know. But doesn't a person who believes know? Well, you see, in Greek, this is a present articular participle. That is, it's got the word the and it's got a participle, and it's in the present tense. And in Greek, that does not necessarily say anything about the temporal sequence or the time sequence. All he's saying is, I'm writing to believers. I'm writing to people who have believed in Christ, who are believers, so that they might know they have eternal life. And clearly, since they don't know they have eternal life, what he's still doing is he's talking to people who are confused believers and who have lost sight of the fact that as believers they have eternal life. And this is brought out, by the way, in chapter 2 and verses 25 and 26. And this is the promise that God has given us eternal life. And now we get that same expression again. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. You see, this isn't a new problem. This has been a problem all along. There are lots of people that do not believe that we can be sure we have eternal life. And they were being deceived by false teachers that John called antichrist, people who were against Christ, which I think it were not just of one flavor, but they were a Baskin Robbins sort. You know, they were 31 different antichrists, and they had different doctrines and different things. And one of them was saying that you couldn't be sure that you had eternal life. So then when he gets to 5.13, he's saying, I'm writing to you who believe, I'm writing to believers that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, he's calling believers back to the faith that led to their salvation so that they will be certain that they have eternal life. And thus the conclusion we can draw is John's readers could and should be sure that they have eternal life, and you can and should be sure that you have eternal life. You can know it. You don't need to guess it or hope it or worry about it because God has given testimony in court, legal testimony, that the one who believes in his Son has everlasting life. And if you accept that testimony, then you know that you have everlasting life. And it's as simple as that. Let's also look at John 11, 25 through 27. We looked at this last night. This is Jesus talking to Martha. Now Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Physical death will come, but yet the person will be resurrected. That's a guarantee. Secondly, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That is, there will be no, physical, no spiritual death, because eternal life is eternal. So Jesus is guaranteeing that the one who has life, eternal life, will always have eternal life. He will never die. And then he says to Martha, do you believe this? And as Zane Hodges pointed out earlier today, Martha does not say, I hope so, I guess so, I think so, let me see if I persevere, check with me in 40 years. She says, yes, Lord, I believe. And then she pegs the basis of her belief on who Jesus is. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. She knows that the Christ is the one who guarantees future resurrection, and eternal life to all who believe in Him. Secure eternal life to all who believe in Him. 
Martha did not have any doubts about her salvation. And notice, we don't read uh, at the end of verse 27, Jesus rebuked Martha and said, How dare you say, Yes, Lord, I believe. How presumptuous of you, Martha. I told you I'm the resurrection and the life, and that whoever believes in me, will never, though he die, yet will he live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. I know I told you that, but you can't know for sure that applies to you. That may not apply to you because you may not have the Ed Sullivan faith. You know, the really big faith. <laughs> and so you've got to wait and see what kind of faith you've got, Martha. No, we don't see that. And John doesn't slip anything in there either. Do you notice that? She says she knows this. And by the way, in John 20, 31, John says anyone who knows this has everlasting life. Martha was sure. There's no doubt about it. She has the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in front of her to verify. So she had certainty. Look also at John 13, 10 and 11. <coughs> Jesus was uh, washing the disciples' feet and he comes to Peter's feet and Peter says, No, no, I'm not worthy to have you wash my feet. And then Jesus says in verse 10, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And then notice this, And you are clean, but not all of you. And you are clean, talking to Peter and ten of the other eleven disciples, but not all of you, and that's reference to Judas, for he knew who would betray him, therefore he said you are not all clean. <coughs> Clearly, the Apostle Peter and all of the other apostles, excluding Judas, knew from this statement that they were eternally secure because Jesus said, you are clean. Any person that has been cleansed by God and stands in a state of being clean is a person that knows they are secure in Christ. Now, I believe what we have here is a uh, foreshadowing of what we see in 1 John 1, 9 that the person who is clean still needs ongoing cleansing for his feet in the sense of fellowship forgiveness. Like 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But yet the person that needs that fellowship cleansing is already clean. But these people, these disciples, they knew for sure they were already saved. And if someone had come to them and said, Guys, you're not really sure you're clean, they would have said wait a minute, I have the word of the Lord Jesus Christ I have. You're wrong. Because God himself told me that I'm clean. So I know I'm clean and I stand on that word. I am clean. Period. They knew for sure. There was no doubt, no shades of doubt about whether they were clean. Finally, look at John 9 with the uh, man born blind. John 9, 35... Now there's a, a dual miracle that takes place in John chapter 9. And uh, we find this in Acts a lot where you have a sign and then a sermon. Well basically what we have here is Jesus gives the sign. He takes a man who's been blind from birth and he restores his physical sight. But then, in the verses we're going to look at, he gives him spiritual sight. That is, the man, for the first time, sees the gospel for what it is, and he believes it. Just like Lydia in Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, where it says that God opened her eyes to heed, to heed the things spoken by Paul, here we have this, where God opens the eyes of this man who now has physical sight, but yet he does not yet have spiritual sight. Notice starting in John 9.35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when they had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Very straightforward question. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And it, Jesus goes on to say, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. 
And the Pharisees picked up on this and they said, are we blind also? They understood he was talking symbolically here of spiritual blindness. And they're saying, are you saying we're spiritually blind? And then Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. In other words, they yet do not believe in Jesus. They yet do not have proper sight. Clearly, this man born blind is an illustration of a person who has had his spiritual sight given to him. This person sees Jesus for who he is, and when Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of God, he doesn't say, maybe, could be, I'll let you know if I persevere. He just says, yes, Lord, I believe. And he worships 